Hey everyone, I'm Alicia Webb with Secure Ninja TV and I'm here at JISEC 2014 in Dubai. I'm speaking with Konstantinos Karagiannis. He is the global technical lead for BT Security. How are you today? Great. Thanks for having me. Definitely. Thanks for speaking with us. Um, now you are a speaker here today at JISEC. I want to know what on earth were you talking about? Well, even though my normal role is uh, ethical hacking, I, I was talking about a personal passion of mine, which is quantum computing and how it's going to change security in the future. Uh, quantum computing. Yeah, I started as a physics major. <laughs> wow, and then you switched over to hacking, and I'm guessing there's some fusion between the two? Uh, well, there will be a big one now, yeah, because quantum computers are going to be able to do things that classical computers simply can't do. And uh, I talked about some of those things. Um, it's going to go sort of back to the early days of supercomputing. Now, back in the 40s, uh, the first supercomputer was Colossus. And that was built expressly for the purpose of cracking encryption to end the war. Well, now we're right back there again, because these quantum machines are going to be able to th slice through PK as if it was a kid's uh, decoder wheel. How are they going to do that? Well, by exploiting a bizarre uh, quantum property known as superposition, instead of having zeros and ones like binary, you can have zero and one at the same time. Uh, and those things called quantum bits or qubits yeah. allow for algorithms that will be able to, using waves that constructively and destructively interfere, show you, for example, the two numbers that are involved in making a really big number like public key infrastructure. I don't even know what to say. Wow. Okay, so just curious, visually, when you see the ones and the zeros, they make for great graphics. I'm a graphics yeah. person. What does the one and the zero look like? Does it look like you'd imagine it? Well, qubits are represented different ways. Sometimes they use Greek letters with zero and one next to them to show like, that the variable can be a certain percentage of either zero or one, a likelihood. Um, but how they're represented isn't so much important as what they can do. Um, but the only thing about quantum computers is if you don't have an algorithm to take advantage of them, they can't really do anything special. So if you were to build a really monstrous quantum computer and then use it to run a video game, it would run like garbage. <laughs> right. Now, when you spoke about this here at JISEC, the audience, you know, did they kind of like already have a background in this? Or is this something that's just like, wow, to everyone? Is it a new thing? Uh, yeah, no, I have to start out with real Discovery Channel type level stuff, you know, showing lots of pictures, uh, things like the double slit experiment. I don't know if you about this. But I do know do about that. Awesome. I recently learned about that. Yeah, so the idea is with double slit experiment, we see that light is both a particle and a wave. And anytime you observe the experiment, the little particles go, oh, he's watching us. We have to behave like we're balls. Yeah. But when he looks away, we can start acting like waves. It's sort of like Toy Story. You know, you walk in the room and the toys right. flop on the floor. And then when you walk out of the room, they're all dancing around. Right. So the quantum world works like that. Um, and the reason why BT talking about this, it's because we actually have done something that no one's ever done before. So in our Adastral Park facility in uh, England, we were able to send quantum keys over live dirty fiber. So the same fiber that people are having phone calls on and watching video on, we were able to send quantum information out into the real world and have it successfully be received. So it's, it's an amazing feat and I'm really proud of those guys. That is crazy. Now you've got quite a background in uh, ethical hacking. You said you were a physics major. How did you be go from being the physics major to all the way where you are today? Well, there was the, you know, the innocent fun of the 2600 Club every month. Uh, I guess it was like the first Thursday of the month at Radio Shack growing up, that kind of thing. <laughs> and I never strayed too far away. You know, I was been computer since I was a little kid, and that, that's quite a while ago. <laughs> um, but uh, I sort of gravitated back and forth, you know, did my degree, I was working in physics and then into here. And I think now there's going to be a whole new synergy, you know, a whole new thing to work on like this. So I'm pretty excited about the future. Because to keep up with these quantum machines, we're going to need new quantum algorithms to encrypt, to protect against them. Right. Wow, that could be a big change for the industry. Can you give us any predictions about how quantum computing could be used in the real world in the future? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, we're right back to the beginning again with supercomputing here. The real reason that governments and other entities are interested in quantum computing is because of its ability to slice encryption. So PK is going to fall rather quickly. DES is going to fall rather quickly because of Grover's algorithm, another quantum algorithm. So within the first few years of some entity getting one of these machines, things aren't going to feel so safe for everyone else. Now, you remember the panic over Heartbleed, right? That was because... 20, maybe 30 of the websites you frequent might have been affected, so you have to change 20, 30 passwords. Now imagine any website you visit, 
can be snooped on because someone can sit there and decrypt in real time what you're doing. Now, that's the kind of panic that could possibly come over us with quantum computers. So the very first use for everyone else will be developing quantum encryption that could protect you against this kind of eavesdropping. Now, the beautiful thing about quantum data is once you look at it, you destroy it if you're not doing it right. So if you send a quantum message and someone peeks, someone man in the middle, uh, something like that on a stream, all of a sudden, bang, it's gone. You know, like right. you wouldn't want a quantum hard drive. It's like, oh, let me access my hard drive. Oh, no, you know, it's all gone. <laughs> right, because it's self-destructive in nature? <laughs> yeah, because quantum mysteries only exist until you look. Once you make an observation, they're not quantum anymore. Right. See, in the quantum world, there's probability and, and waves. And once you observe them, the wave function collapses and you get a definite answer. I mean, that's good if you want a machine to do something. If you wanted to find the two keys in PK, for example. Right it'll collapse and give you the answer. But if you disrupt the calculation, or if you fail to build a machine that can maintain that quantum state, it'll fall apart before you get an answer. So that's the challenges right now. But I think within a couple of years, because in a lab we've already been able to do four qubit machines, six qubit machines, in a couple of years, some big entity in a hidden laboratory somewhere will be able to build a giant, messy, qubit, multi-qubit machine that could crack encryption. Now, will it take a month to set this thing up to run every time? Possibly. You know, imagine it. It'll be this mess where they're, they're calibrating all day just to do one run. It's right. not like push a button and it'll reset. Right. But it's worth it, because if you can put in a month of hundreds of man hours combined and end up with an answer to something that's not doable, even in thousands of years by a classical computer, it's worth it. So within two to three years, I think someone will have one of these things lurking somewhere in the darkness. And then within 10 years, I think they'll be sort of like the early days of the internet where there's maybe 60 institutions that have them networked and communicating with each other. Right. And then we're going to need quantum encryption to protect or else people right. are going to know what we're saying. And then we're going to need quantum cybersecurity. Yeah. That just sounds so cool. Yeah, I just hope there's not like a quantum Facebook because that will just seem like a horrible waste of such a great technology. <laughs> hey, look what I did today at the beach. You know, really? All this technology and that's what we're going to say about it? Yeah. Oh my Hopefully God. it'll be used for banks first. <laughs> Hopefully. They're going to need it the most, definitely. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. This is a crazy interesting topic. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and you're at DEF CON and Black Hat. Yeah. And we're going to talk to you again because if anything happens in quantum computing between now and then, I want to know about it. Thanks. And, and who knows, with the guys at Industrial Park, it might be us doing it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, everyone at home, so much for watching. I hope you learned something there. I certainly did. Make sure you don't miss anything that we're shooting out here at JISEC. Follow us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram. We're, we're posting a bunch of cool pictures that we're shooting out here at JISEC in Dubai. Oh, and definitely like us on Quantum Facebook. I'm Alicia Webb. Thank you so much for watching. Secure Ninja TV is brought to you by SecureNinja.com, a world leader in cybersecurity training and certification. Our master instructors will help build you into a highly skilled and marketable security professional. Secure Ninja, forging cybersecurity experts.